come, Lord Jesus, in your resurrection power this day. Amen. Well, the days of Ezekiel were a bleak time for the people of Israel. Like what we face today with the coronavirus, except much worse. Ezekiel was a prophet among the Jews who were living in Babylon at that time. What were they doing in Babylon? Well, let me just take you back to Sinai. Remember in the book of Exodus where God had parted the seas and brought the people into um, Sinai on the way to the promised land and he cut covenant with them he made an agreement with them. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And if, and here are the laws I'm giving you. If you obey the laws that I give to you this day, it will go well for you when you reach the promised land. You will prosper. You will be fruitful. But if you disobey these laws I'm giving you, you will lose everything. Well, that was centuries earlier, but now remember where we are. Last week, David preached about the fall of Jerusalem in 686 B.C. And uh, remember, the Babylonian army came and destroyed what was left of the kingdom of Judah, killed most of the men, burned the cities, plundered the treasures, and took a remnant of the people as captives to Babylon. So here they were in exile in Babylon, removed from their land, surrounded by an empire (coughs) of a people who were much more numerous than they. They were despondent, facing extinction of their nation, and also the possible ending of their relationship with Yahweh God. Would the people of God continue? Talk about existential crisis. That's what they were facing. At Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 11, the nation of Israel says, Our bones have dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off, they said. Now that language of being cut off, that's covenant language. To be cut off from the presence of God, from relationship with God, to be separated from him, from his people, was the worst possible situation. They'd lost all hope for their future as a covenant people. The nation felt dead. They needed resurrection. Now, in our day, the days of the coronavirus, they're bleak for us, too. Very few people saw this coming. The world's been mostly unprepared. I kick myself sometimes. I read, I remember reading in December about the Wuhan virus and the warnings of the epidemiologists who did see it coming. There's this measure called the R0, R0, that measures the infectiousness of diseases and the rate at which it spreads. And this was very, very high. And even then, there were warnings that it would spread worldwide. Now, most people get this thing. I mean, it's important to wash hands and all of that, but my understanding is that most people are getting it simply by breathing the air near someone else who has it. So everything's shutting down because this thing can be deadly. Whole nations are on lockdown. Italy, now Spain. The numbers, I'm sure, will continue to rise. Schools are closed. Borders are closed. Travel is shutting down, supply chains are uh, interrupted. It's, it's uh, not possible to get certain things anymore because things have shut down. Sports leagues, 
buyers in the stock market, many churches, more and more losses every day. We're hunkering down inside at home, teleworking, watching church on live stream, wondering how can we be safe. Beloved of God, we're in a a time of a kind of exile. Exile in isolation. Isolation from the people we love. Isolation from the activities that we love. Most of us thought that we were safe. Just a few weeks ago. But now it turns out that we have no control over this thing. We feel helpless. We're isolating for our safety. It feels like death. So I have a question for you this morning. Can these bones live? During our current crisis, we have had hopes. First, that it wouldn't come here. Well, now, that it won't be that bad. Or then there's our hope that it's, uh, it's going to pass soon. But those hopes are either gone or they're diminishing, right? It may take months to return to some semblance of normalcy. Oh, we, we still have our national identity here in the States, but <clears throat> with the current partisanship, that's all the more up for grabs. We have our covenant relationship with God. But this virus is putting barriers between brothers and sisters in the Lord. Believers need each other now more than ever. People need a human touch. We need to break bread with one another. A single woman I know came to the Wednesday night meeting, and I gave her one of these. It's like, I'm not going to hug you for real. I'm just going to you know, give you a virtual hug, and I could just see her face fall. She just, she came to church for that hug. But these good things, these 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 needed things, they're they're considered risky now. It's even dangerous because people can die if you and I aren't careful. It's a heavy burden to bear. It feels like death. So I want to ask you again, can these bones live? I believe that God has some words of hope for us today from the book of Ezekiel. Words of resurrection. So please turn up uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 in your Bibles. Some of you might want to just Do it on your phone rather than picking up that Bible, which I guess we're going to have to sanitize those as well. Verse 1 and 2, Ezekiel tells us that the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them, and they were very many and very dry. Now, I want you to understand that that this scene that Ezekiel is speaking of is what we call an open vision, okay? This is a prophetic vision given while a prophet is awake, and it seems like he's watching all of this happen in real time on a movie screen, and and many things happen. Happen. This didn't happen in historical time. This, this story of the bones, this isn't one of those miracles that God did that we can point to and say, isn't God great, his power? No, this is a metaphor. This is a prophetic picture of what God was going to do for Israel. Are you with me? So God shows Ezekiel a battlefield in a valley that had become a mass grave, except that here no one has buried the dead. The dead are Judah's armies, which is a metaphor for the nation of Israel. The skeletons are piled up. It must have been horrific to see. Like if you go to the Holocaust Museum, seeing the pictures 
of the, the dead piled up. And curiously, the Spirit of God leads Ezekiel back and forth, walking among the bones. You see that? It's not enough to just show him. He's got to actually go into the valley, and he walks him back and forth in it. He wants them, I guess, he wants Ezekiel to know how dead they really are. The curious thing is that the Spirit of God wants Ezekiel to see and ponder death. Why is that? Well, I believe that God wants all of us to look from time to time at death. We need to look at death to see it for the enemy that it really is. To see that one day, to remember that one day, you and I are going to die. Now, when you get to be my age, you know this with a certainty. But you young people think you're invulnerable, that you're going to live forever. I did. It, seemed, it, it, it felt like it. We don't like looking at death. And we don't like it for the same reason that we don't like looking at sin. We don't like looking at brokenness in our own lives. And the reason is that looking at those things makes us feel sad. It makes us feel ashamed. Sometimes it makes us feel angry, and other times it can make us feel disgusted. And we want to avoid negative emotions, and so we don't look at those things often. But, I, but this morning, I want to encourage you to think with me back on your own story of how God rescued you. How was it that God brought himself to you? For most of us, me included, there was personal pain and brokenness in my own life. And there was an acknowledgement of my sin, my separation from God, my need for a Savior. The truth is that God uses the brokenness, the pain, the lack, and the negativity in our lives to draw us to him. Can I hear an amen? And if we were to share our stories this morning, and I encourage you to share your story of how you came to Christ with someone today. When we share our stories, we'll see many, many of us, it was very similar. So for me, some of you have heard my, uh, my story of how I initially came to Christ in my 20s, or sorry, in my teens, and uh, then I, uh, I abandoned him when I was 18. But then God used my brokenness as a single man to see my need for a godly wife, which drew me back to church, drew me into a relationship with Ginger, and most importantly, drew me back to himself. God uses our brokenness and makes something beautiful out of it. Then God asks Ezekiel a question in verse 3. Can these bones live? This is one of God's trick questions. How many of you know that God sometimes asks trick questions? Right? Right? You see, in the natural, the prophet knows that there's no way that these dry bones are ever going to themselves uh, turn into a living army once more. But he's in the spirit, remember, in this open vision, and he knows. He's a prophet. He knows God can do anything, and this is just a vision. But notice that Ezekiel doesn't say to God, he doesn't say, well, of course these bones can live because you can do anything, God. Instead, Ezekiel hedges his bets. And he says in response to God, cautiously, he says, Lord, you know. Hey, that's always a good answer, right? You can use that when God asks you a question. Lord, you know. Hmm. Because God can do anything in a vision, but the real question that was in play here is can God resurrect the remnant of Israel from exile to come fully into their destiny? I want you to understand the people of God in, of Israel knew full well since the time of Abraham that while they themselves were a small people, 
who had relationship with Yahweh, that somehow Yahweh God was going to use his relationship with them to bless the entire world, to save the entire world. And they knew this was a part of their destiny. So all of this was in play in terms of will we continue as a nation? They want, and in Ezekiel didn't know if national revival or indeed national resurrection was possible. The answer lay in God's hands. Only God could save them. Brothers and sisters, only God can save us now. In verse 4, God commands Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. Now, in the natural, this is a ridiculous thing to ask a prophet to do, right? But once again, he's in a vision. In verse 7, Ezekiel says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. How unlike us. Really. Sadly. How unlike us. Usually, you and I are more like Jonah. Running away from our hard assignment from God to go to Nineveh, the place of our enemy, and to witness there. Instead, we typically run toward Tarshish, You know what Tarshish is? It's Spain, the Costa del Sol, baking in the sun, the place of comfort, the opposite direction of our heavenly assignment. Beloved of God, I want to ask you some hard questions this morning. Do you know what God's calling you to do as this virus gets worse? Do you know your assignment? Do you know who in your neighborhood, in your circle of influence, that God is calling you to check on? And when you do, how are you going to respond? Beloved, if you and I obey God's call, if the church of Jesus Christ will obey God's call in this season, this could be the church's finest hour. This could be a turning point for millions to come back to God. I suggest that you read Martin Luther's letter whether one may flee from a deadly plague. We've got copies for you out in the the, uh, fellowship hall, and you can get it on the internet. Martin Luther is no longer subject to copyright laws. (laughs) Praise the Lord. So the question is, will we love and pray people to health? Will we deliver food to the sick, will we love our neighbors who might unintentionally kill us? As Pastor Richard Farmer says, obedience is a necessary element in God's scheme of national revival. You may wonder why we aren't more alive. It's because the text of our life reads, God said, walk in the spirit, but we decided to walk in the flesh. God said, become a functioning part of my body, and we decided to do our own thing. Now, I'm not talking about those of you who are self-isolating at home. I'm talking about, um, and I'm glad you're here on live stream, praise God. I'm talking about those believers who have separated themselves from the body of Christ altogether and think they don't need the church. They don't have an assignment with the body. God said, love your enemies. But we decided, "Uh, I think I'll just let them get what's coming to them. God said, go to Nineveh. 
but too often we go to Tarshish instead. Notice that God could have spoken directly to the bones himself, right? He can do that. But instead, he chooses this son of man, this prophet and priest named Ezekiel, and he says, you, son of man, you prophesy to these bones. God uses you and me to speak the word of life to dead people, to bring the death, the dead, back to life. All around you, the Bible says, are dead men. Dead men and women. Dead men walking. Apart from Jesus, people aren't only sick. They're not just confused. The Bible says that spiritually they're dead. That's why they need to be born again to eternal life. In this virus season, I believe God is sending you and me to dead, sick people to bring them to health, to bring them to eternal life, to give them hope. I want to encourage you in this season to read Matthew 25 once more. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came. I was hungry and you fed me. You'd better believe these bones can live. Now, here's the best part. After the preaching and prophesying, after those bones begin to rattle, oh, I love that, the rattling of the bones coming together, and then the tendons come on the bones, and then the flesh begins to come on the bones, and I'm getting excited because I'm, I'm seeing this happen, but that must have looked pretty disgusting, all that happening right in front of his eyes, right? But there it was, exciting at the same time. And then finally there stood this mighty army. But God wasn't done yet. Because then he told Ezekiel a second time, he said, Breathe my ruach, my breath, my spirit into them. And when he did, this mighty army came to life. Beloved, we need the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, we're dead. Where the Spirit is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit is, God comes in power. We need to ask for a deeper infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we can see God's resurrection power all around us. So this army was resurrected. God brought the believing dead back to life. He spoke tenderly to them with promises of blessings, of peace, and prosperity in their own land. You know, this happened before, this breathing the breath of life. Think with me to Genesis chapter 2, right? So God forms Adam from the dirt of the ground, and then he's there. He looks like Adam, but he's not alive, and so God breathes his breath into Adam. And it happens later in John chapter 20. The resurrected Jesus appears to the 12 frightened apostles, and he breathes his Holy Spirit upon them. I believe that that's when they were born again. They believed in the resurrected Jesus, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, since Adam, this happens in groups. This isn't mainly a one-on-one -on -one deal. Ezekiel's vast resurrected army, the 12 in the upper room, in John chapter 20, the 120 in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. Beloved, the enemy at this season would divide us. You see what's happening. But God wants to bring us together. Can I hear an amen? He wants us to be together. Now, in the age of the coronavirus, you and I are wise to practice social distancing, to be mindful of risk factors 
in self-isolation. We need to keep some physical distance. But brothers and sisters, can we agree to be one in the spirit? Amen? Can we? We can be one on the phone. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I'm seeing just enormous opportunities. You know, whenever there is a crisis, there's also an opportunity. And some of you, you know what is going to happen? You're going to learn how to use FaceTime for the first time. You're going to learn Zoom technology. You're going to have group chats on your computers. We're going to do classes by Zoom so you can stay home. We need to come together as much as we can, mindful of the risks. Now, I have a kindness, a favor to ask of you. I want to ask you, in the name of God, would you help me to help others, people in our church, to stay connected? Beloved, hospitality begins in the household of God. Uh, Praise be to God. Uh, I was just in the coffee hour, and I was talking to this newcomer who's come from abroad and is on business for a couple of weeks here, living in a hotel, and one of our families are taking them into him into their house for the next two weeks. This is the kind of counter-cultural witness that will win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you consider being a part of a team to call people who are isolating? If you would, please email me, clancy at holyspiritleesburg.org, and I would be delighted to put you to work. If we do this, beloved, these bones will live. You know, without the breath of God, the Spirit of God, nothing important happens in the church. That's where the life is. The life is in the Spirit. We need God to fill us again. We need to see the breath of God move in us again. I don't know about you, but I want to see more people come make professions of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to see more sick people healed. I want to, I'm longing to see we've been praying for revival in our county for 10 years consistently. We need to see this. We need to see the spirit of death pass over our homes as in the days of the Passover. And we can pray it. We can pray Psalm 91 that God would keep the pestilence away from us. We need God more than ever. So the question is, can these bones live? Church, would you believe with me that God can and will do it again? Do it again, sovereign Lord. Do it again. Say this with me. These bones shall live. Let's say it again. These bones shall live. One more time. These bones shall live. So in the face of the coronavirus, let's not shrink back into isolation. Be the body of Christ. God is looking for someone to stand in the gap. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your resurrection power. We thank you, God, for this marvelous prophetic picture that we have in Ezekiel of the resurrection, which you clarified for us beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is our destiny, Lord God, as those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that that our bodies will be resurrected. Praise be to God. Lord, I pray that you give us You expand our horizons beyond our, um, uh, but beyond this life into the horizons of heaven. Lord, call us up higher. 
speak to us clearly so that we can hear. Help us to take whatever time we need to know what you're calling us to do. Give us joy as we sacrifice for you. In Jesus' name, amen.